Martin Luther King did for us was not just lead black people. He led all Americans. And he said to all Americans, look in the mirror. Look at who we are and what we are. Is this what we really want to be? We have to change. We have to get rid of Jim Crow. We have to get rid of discrimination. We have to get rid of segregation. We have to start marching forward. And under his leadership, until we lost him in 1968, that's what America did. So when I came into the Army, segregation had just ended a few years earlier. And the Army was the most integrated institution in America. And that second Civil War, the nonviolent one, had just begun. But the Army was already integrated. And I'll never forget something they said to me when I got to Fort Benning, Georgia for my initial training. And remember this, all of my young friends, because it was not only relevant to me 50 years ago, it's relevant to you now. My commanders looked at me and said, pal, we don't care if you're black or white, you're green now. <laughs> we don't care if you came from a poor immigrant family in the South Bronx section of New York and that you were deprived. Save that for your therapist, we don't care. We don't care that you didn't go to West Point, you didn't go to Harvard, you didn't go to Princeton. You got a 2.0 C average out of the City College of New York. Any 2.0s here? I don't think so. <laughs> the only thing we care about, pal, can you perform? Will you perform? Will you work hard? If you perform, you'll get ahead. If you don't perform, you won't get ahead. No excuses. First thing I learned in the Army. No excuses. Just perform. Work hard. Believe in yourself. Believe in America. Believe that you can do anything you want to do as long as you're willing to work hard and believe in yourself. Too often as I go around now, people will say, gee, it's wonderful. You were National Security Advisor to President Reagan. You were Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and you're responsible for all those many, many soldiers, three million people. And you were Secretary of State. Gee, that's terrific. And they think I just dropped out of the sky and became Chairman and Secretary of State. I even have some people come up to me and say, gee, when you were a young kid growing up, in the South Bronx section of New York. Did you dream you could become chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the Armed Forces of the United States? And I always answer them, yeah. <laughs> there I was. I believe I was about 10 years old. I was standing on a street corner, 163rd and Kelly. And I said to myself, self, I believe you're going to grow up and become chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. <laughs> it's not the way it happened. The way it happened was hard work, no excuses, constantly studying, constantly learning, and constantly believing in myself, and constantly believing that I lived in a country that was changing. I was living in a country that was willing to measure me, willing to measure all of us now, on the basis of our performance. And as you go through life, just remember, that people don't want to hear about what troubles you might have had in the past. People want to know what can you do in the future? What can you do now? You can learn a lot about leadership. You can learn a lot about what I know about leadership from just watching how President-elect Barack Obama ran his campaign. It was a brilliant political operation, but as I looked at it, it was also a brilliant military operation. His leadership technique and the way in which he ran this campaign began with a vision. I first met him two years ago. He came to my office in Alexandria, Virginia. We sat, we talked, and he said, well, you know, I'm really serious about you know, thinking about running for president. And I looked at him and said, you sure? You know, you're kind of young. You've only been in the Senate a couple of years. What makes you think you're ready for this? He said, I have a vision. I think I know where this country needs to go, and I want to try and take it there. So whatever you do in life has to begin with a vision. What is it you're trying to accomplish? What purpose are you after? And then you have to translate that vision into specific goals and missions that you are trying to achieve. If you don't do that, it's just a vision floating up there. And then you have to organize yourself. You have to be absolutely honest in measuring the opponent or the enemy, as we would say in the military. 
You have to be deadly honest in measuring your strengths and your weaknesses. We teach this to all of our young leaders in the Army. Know yourself, know your enemy. Know yourself, know your opponents. Know yourself, know the situation you are getting into. And then once you have done that, once you have a clear statement of what you're trying to accomplish that's driven by a vision, then you start to organize your forces. In the military, we bring our battalions and divisions together. We make sure we have all our logistics. We make sure we have air support. In politics, you start to reach out and bring people together, bring forces together. Reach out to the south, to the west, to the east, to the north. Reach out to minorities. Try to get yourself known throughout the country as a person of purpose. You may end up being leaders of only 10 people in an office or maybe a hundred or maybe a thousand. It's the same thing. Become known as a person of purpose. Become known as somebody that people will trust. Become known as a person with a solid reputation, a person of character, a person that people will look up to. And then the next thing they taught us in the military and the next thing I saw Mr. Obama do was understand that leadership is all about followers. I was taught from the very beginning that the role of a leader is to put followers in the best possible environment to get the job done. You're not a leader if you don't have followers. Oh, you might be a visionary leader, but you don't get things done unless you have followers. And the best leaders I've known are those who know how to not just motivate followers, that's you know, a nice word, but you want to inspire followers. EMI stands for that. Now that I is inspire people. Inspire people to believe in you. And if your leadership is infectious because you have a vision, because you have a sense of mission and vision and purpose, then people will vibrate with you. So as young leaders getting yourself ready, always make sure that you approach your leadership task with a sense of passion, a sense of enthusiasm, so that everybody catches that enthusiasm and everybody wants to do what you want to do. Make sure that above all, you understand the importance of followers. You can't be an effective leader if you are sort of, you know, above it all. I'm in my office, the followers are doing what they do. You gotta be there with the followers, you gotta inspire them. They've gotta see you sacrifice along with them. In the military they teach us, Lieutenant Powell, General Powell, you may be cold, but you must never show to your soldiers that you are cold. You may be afraid, you may be terrified, but you must never show fear to your soldiers or to the enemy. You may be hungry, but you will always eat last. You may be tired, but you will make sure your soldiers rest before you rest. A leader sets the example, and by setting that inspirational example, you inspire others. You always have to make sure that all of your energies go into preparing the followers for the battle ahead.